Major metamodernist menaced by mendacious mind control cult. <laughs> Sex, drugs, and power games masquerading as integrative developmental complexity and spiritual Ponzi scheme. Shadowy forces using fake shadow work. Well, star Wii spaces are insidiously undermined by a deviant they using Wii spacing to sabotage the S. These stories and more today on the Integral Stage. I'm your host, Layman Pascal, and I'm here with Emil and Sebastian to explore the go and change movement and more generally to figure out what goes right and what goes wrong in the attempt to set up transformative organizations and communities. Hi, guys. Hello. Nice to be here. So if the people listening are anything like me, they hear the phrase psychedelic sex cult in German eco village and they think, great, maybe that's what I need. <laughs> but this is not a happy story. It's a cautionary tale. This is how we don't want our psychedelic sex cults in German eco villages to operate. So I'm going to prompt Emil to tell us his adventure and what he wrote about on Moderna. And then we'll get Sebastian's take on some of the people involved and explore some more general themes after that. Uh, but obviously, anybody who really feels like they have something to say, leap in at any time. Emil, what the heck is a ZEG and why were you there? Well, the ZEG is, um, is this e eco village near, near Berlin in Bad Belzig. They've been there for about 30 years. And yeah, doing all kinds of hippie stuff. For, for example, this summer camp where people come to meditate and do yoga and self-development and communion and, and, and all these nice things. And, uh, and this year I was invited to speak with the, yeah, about the Hansi books. And I thought that was a great opportunity to get out in the countryside uh, with my wife and, um, yeah, promote my stuff. And, you know, I, I arrived there and I, yeah, I needed to pre prepare for uh, prepare for this talk. And I was being told to like, oh, you should, uh, could you please talk about the model of hierarchical complexity? And I thought, that, um, uh, uh, well, that's like a, that's a pretty shitty, shitty topic. It's very complex. We have like, a hundred guests there, you know, just, yeah, I don't think like the model of hierarchical complexity was so, so, so I changed my mind. I was not being paid anyway. So I just wanted to talk about uh, the listening society. And um, so I, I need, I need, needed, uh, you know, a few days to prepare. And, and, and then um, I got this, uh, you know, I got this message from, uh, from this guy called Felix from something called Go and Change. And uh, yeah, I didn't know who Felix was. I have never heard about Go and Change. So yeah, I agreed. And um, we were going to be on the same po podium discussion, uh, like the panel discussion is called in English. Um, and I didn't know about that before. Uh, apparently this guy had been invited like five days before or something like that. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I just agreed to meet him. And yeah, so I went there and he said, oh, you Bring, bring your uh, fiance. Uh, now, now she's my wife. And I just thought it was going to be this casual discussion about the, uh, the, the panel discussion. But, you know, I arrived and then suddenly we, we would sit down in this like circle of five or six other people. Um, and then he, he, he started, you know, they like had this energy of trying to sell me something. And I remember him saying that, oh, Emil, I hear that you're interested in, in, uh, in communities. I'm just like, I'm interested in a lot of things, not that I'm particularly interested in communities, but yeah, whatever. I was saying, it's kind of like priming me. And then he started promoting this community, which um, was, um, as he said, was based on the complexity levels that they had like a social hierarchy based on who's like, who was on the highest level of complexity. And uh, he, he did admit that he hadn't read, uh, uh, finished the Hansi books. So I think the guy just assumed that I was like just, just as big a stage fetishist uh, as himself. Uh, and I would think it was a wonderful idea, but to me, it just sounded like, by, by the, like the most fucked up idea to, you know, when we're dealing with, 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 with stage theory, we, we want to make away with all these um, uh, 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 like arbitrary dominator hierarchies and create natural hierarchy hierarchies and you don't do that but then by using stage theory to create another uh, arbitrary dominator hierarchy you know it's just the most insane idea i could come so so the meeting kind of went down downhill from there he tried to sell this uh, uh, idea of his and um, yeah I didn't think much about it here we have another dude trying to sell me something and yeah I'm not interested so yeah um, I was glad when the meeting meeting ended 
Um, and he was, but but he, he was like quite pushy, you know, like sending me a message. Ah, do you want to meet again? Again? No, no, I need to need to prepare my course. Um, so uh, I, I declined him, declined him like several times until he then wrote that, oh, uh, one of the summer camp organizer, uh, organizers would like to spe speak to you. I think uh, that's, that's a big weird. Why doesn't the summer camp uh, a guy just contact me directly? I'm just like, what does that have to do? But they were smart. Ah, OK, uh, just um, just give me his number, then I'll contact him. Yeah. So I contacted the summer ca camp. Uh, one of the summer camp organizers and uh, we uh, agreed to meet and again i just assumed that it was going to be a discussion about this uh, about my talk and about the panel discussion but when i met him again you know we were sitting there with like four other people including felix this guy from go and change that i'd said that i hadn't time for it's just like okay i just yeah and I thought we were going to talk about uh, the panel discussion and the things, but they just started, you know, guilt tripping me for not participating and not spending enough time with them. And, and at the time, I just thought of it as like these like community obsessed hippies or, well, like I can understand if people had been looking forward to, to see me and spending time with me that uh, then, yeah, uh, that's uh, disappointing when I'm not, when I'm not available. And then I said, yeah, I'm sorry, but I don't have time. And then the new thing is the end of it, you know, but they just kept on going. Oh, and in, in the end, it's like pissed me off, like trying to guilt trip me. I didn't, I didn't sign up for this. I signed up for giving a talk and a participant in a panel, participating in a panel discussion. So, but at the time, you know, I, I didn't think much of it. It was only when, the, you know, we, we, we did participate in one of the, we, one of these we spaces, and we thought there was like something fishy going on here. It's kind of like you have these people, you know, like kind of like like adult bullying people, you know, and then people are supposed to reveal all their inner truths, like in, in front of a bunch of strangers. And then uh, some people are going to tell them a, 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 a truth or two they wasn't aware of in front of everybody else, you know, it was like busting their shadows. And if they decline, they cannot decline and say, because they no, no, because you're not aware of it. And then people, I just like, think, this is hmm, there's something fishy going on, like like shadow work. Yes, that, that that's good if that's what you need. Do that with your therapist, but like doing it in in a circle with a lot of strangers. And we go down. And I talked to my fiance about it, and you know, it came out. Wow, we, we later uh, we later renamed it the the, the gaslighting chamber because that's that's what it can be used for. They were using it very lightly here. But it's just like, whoa, you can really manipulate people uh, with this technology. So so kind of there we got like, a, oh, um, these people, I don't want to have too much to do with them. Um, but this Felix guy, he, he kind of like every time at lunch, you know, he would come and sit as close to me as possible. Like it was like really creepy, you know, like I couldn't like avoid the guy. And uh, and then at, at, at one point, at one, uh, one um, at lunch, then um, I had a friend of mine who, um, yeah, uh, wanted to uh, say a few things about um, the same camp organizer that I've been in contact with previously. He had, had given a talk and he wanted to talk about that. So just like some, yeah, there's some criticism for the contents. But it didn't go fast before the whole table and apparently like all these go and change people were there just started, you know, going at him. And it was not for the contents of his criticism. No, 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 no. It was for uh, his personality and it was his shadow and it was his ego. And how dared he let he to criticize someone who had done so much for the world? And how, who did he think he was? It was nothing with, with the contents, just about his own personal virtues, you know, or, or, or lack thereof. And, and the guy was like, when a whole table just go at you, and it was kind of like, you know, the moment that Felix started, the whole table just knew, ah, this is what we're going to do. We are going to bully that guy into place. Like he was just steamrolled. And I was like, holy shit, you know, he's sitting there um, in my food suddenly. What the fuck is going on here? This is not very nice. And um, yeah, so it just ended up in a big argument. And, uh, you know, this Felix guy, he knew how to push my buttons and I probably... Yeah, well, I, I told to his to, to his face that that I thought, well, the, the, no, no, no. The thing was that he pushed my button by using 
uh, adult development stage theory by arguing that he was on a higher stage, you know, and when I would evolve to his level, then I would understand I was wrong. It's just like, what kind of way of arguing is that? Uh, like, instead of arguing about the contents, you know, we have this who's on the high, it's just like, um, and him claiming to be on on, uh, on, on cross paradigmatic. Uh, yeah, right, buddy. <laughs> so just like genius level. The guy was not a, he was a genius at pushing my buttons. Yeah. So so I have like probably said to his face that I thought he was an asshole. He was full of shit. And, and but also that like he was, they, these go and change people are constantly talking about love and community, but you, you don't like, you don't see it. You don't feel any love. It's just like dead eyes, stale bodies. And then, you know, compared to all these nice hippies with their open bodies, you know, just want to give you a hug and the eyes are just like, uh, uh, like, like open, full of love. Then these people were just like tense and, and ready to engage you in, in like uh, cognitive jujitsu at any, every point, you know? So it's just like something was, off with these people so then i went home and then i googled them and the thing that popped up you know we're talking about two dead children we are talking about uh, brainwashing we are talking about rape apparently what they do is that they peer pressure people into taking psychedelics you know and then they have sex with them and i mean like if if you're tripping balls how can you consent Right. And also when you are high on, on LSD, you are very, very open to manipulate manipulation and especially sex. So that's, that's what they do in the CIA to break people. You know, uh, this is C some serious CIA stuff that, that, that you put people, um, um, give people psychedelics, you know, and then you brainwash them, but among other things with sex and, 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 and so on. So, so I just, discovered all these horrible things popping up on my screen and i was like there's no way that i am going on that panel discussion no 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 no, no. and and i'm especially not gonna i found out that the whole panel discussion there they, they were like all in to go and change like even a guy that i warned about felix and this ah this intellectual integral guy there professor guy or, or whatever and and then i found out that there was his old mentor so like slowly, like I, I, I found out that the whole summer camp had been infiltrated by this cult. Yeah, um, really scary stuff. And, and you know, I confronted the leaders, but they were unable to see what they have gotten them, th themselves into. They didn't believe anything of uh, of all these stories. But you know, the, the more people I talked to, like the more of this the same story about sexual abuse, you know, uh, 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 ch children dying, people needing therapy for years uh, and people being scared. And they didn't believe any of it. And um, yeah, yeah. So um, I decided to not participate in that panel discussion. And then I, I told the, um, the eco-village people um, at the SEC that the uh, if you don't end your end your collaboration with this dangerous organization within two months, I'm going to write about my experiences, yeah, um, and your role in it. And now it's been two months, and yes, they have decided that they are not going to collaborate with Go and Change on the next summer camp. But they have not officially distanced themselves from uh, Go and Change. And still, if you go to Go and Change website, you know the Sec Eco Village is is still there. And 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 most of all, the people from Go and Ch Change are still coming and going at the Sec. And they can. And, and and that's why I consider that the Sec is not a safe place to be because am I like uh, many of the prominent members of the sex some of the leaders out there are still deeply into this and are inviting these dangerous cult people uh, to the eco village uh, which enables them to brainwash and manipulate and and threaten uh, people so it's all very very uh, sad story yeah. in the footnotes to your article you say uh hi felix i know you're reading this 
So uh, have you had any feedback from either Go and Change or Zeg since you've written the article? I have been, uh, I have heard nothing from Go and Change, but I also think they understand that we have nothing to talk about. Uh, I am in contact with people at the SEC, and it needs to be said that the vast majority uh, of the SEC members are critical of Go and Change. Yeah. And I'm in contact with members who um, are resisting, uh, who, who are resisting this. Um, and I really hope that at uh, the end of the day, um, that SEC will distance itself from Go and Change, that they will make a decision, and that Go and Change will not have access um, to uh, to this village. That they will have house for board. Uh, what's it called in uh, in English? That they will be, yeah. Uh, not welcome. Um, okay. oh, Terrific. Um, Sebastian, uh, you have some personal experience and observations of some of the people involved in this movement. What's, give us a little bit of background on how you're connected and uh, what your impression of these people is. Okay, so I've been talking with Emil about this um, a few times and my connection uh, with them is pretty deep. I actually in some way started the previous project, the That To Go and Change, in 2011. There is a group that I still lead uh, called iMove, which previously was a group for young people from the Integrales Forum Deutschland, which is the main integral organization of Germany. And I met Felix there in 2008 at the last event of the second generation of iMove. So there were a few generations following each other. And 2011, we took over and started the whole thing again. At that time, I was actually the, um, the one creating the content and the orientation. And Phoenix was more kind of like an assistant. And um, I created an, an ideology there that was based a little on my experiences with Enlightened Next and with some radical political groups. And the, the central idea was to be more consequential than the other integral movements around us but also being more integrative as I felt that the, that the call for radical, radicalism and consequentialism that was uh, present in the night next made sense, but the lack of an integral embrace of life was a problem. And I thought we could combine these two things. And for five years then, we had these events, which were not an intentional community. We, we had events all over the place in the middle of Europe for three to four days for weekends. And we also created like networks that were like little local spin-offs. And um, about half or three quarter of the people who, stuck, who formed Go and Change later in 2015 and 2016, were actually part of uh, my group. And um, as was Felix and a few others who later on became team members, so to say. And between iMove and Go and Change, there's a strange connection because as I also told Amy in our previous talks, I had this tendency, which I adopted a little from, um, from Enlightened Next, but tried to integralize to look out for what made previous attempts at radical spiritual political movements dangerous or stupid or pathological. And I thought of these to be like um, shadow work, especially unquestioned when I felt that shadow work needs a lot of intimacy and trust that had to be built up over time and would not be something that I would do with anyone coming into the club for the first time, but not, even, not for a second time or third time and generally emotional work, anything that actually produces emotional bonding. I had a certain um, vision and idea of a sobriety 
Yeah, and I was more interested in I was interested in the whole Wii space practice thing, but more into causal and non-dual states and less into tribing, less less into emotional bonding. And I also had a developmental psychological perspective on it that there was a problem with Wii space practice as we knew it, because technically uh, an evolutionary perspective on Wii space practice sees an I space Wii space its space practice as just moving from I to we would obviously be a regression into tribalism or ethnocentric consciousness or anything like that. And also, um, I also blocked sexual, tantric, and psychedelic content. I said it would only go there maybe uh, many, many years later if some parameters, some, some, some points would have been reached that I couldn't Tell so, Sebastian, I'm, I'm hearing a little bit of crackle on your microphone. Are you hearing that too, Emil, or is it at yes. my end? Okay. okay. Suggestion? Can you try switching to a different microphone? Yeah, sure. So I tried to, to create something like a perfect radical spiritual group that would exclude all the problematic content and all the problematic practices that, were, that I've seen historically and personally prior to that. And yeah, the, uh, 2014, there was someone else coming to the group, Kai Fischek, and the event with him, like he was just a participant and the event with him went all right. Pretty good, actually, all of our events were very special. By the way, Alexander Kapistran, who uh, post, uh, posted that article about Gone Change, he also was there for the first time at that event. And there was something like a mutiny happening because people started to form groups that were not participating in the, uh, in the official events. And the central idea was that I would not participate because people felt too pressured on many levels, which I found to be completely okay because I wanted to let people have their autonomy. But that of time uh, went on to, well, with... Uh, some mutations that I can't tell what they were, what they were because I was not present, obviously. Um, to form gone change within the uh, within the time of one or one and a half uh, year, forming officially at the end of 2015, and gone change those became something like um, the strange twisted sibling of IMOF, like um, they started to do everything that I would say we should not do, but using the same consequential consequentialism, the same, let's just really go for it attitude. And um, by the way, I also started in 2013, the very first integral event ever where people were stage assessed before, and we used those stage assessments also in collective practice. But that was only temporary and experimental. Like usually these were like two or three hour experiments that did not involve uh, manipulative or uh, any kind of social pressure situations. Actually, the people were just, um, were just uh, aligning themselves sometimes in certain orders. And I just wanted to see and have others see how they felt if they would align hierarchically in the room but there was no social action that uh, came from that. So, yeah, so, so these are the, so this is a relation. I knew or know most people since 10 or 11 years, I have created two elements of the whole ideology or practice system. And then there was this kind of mutiny and go and change started to go into that other direction. And at the beginning, I also supported it. Uh, because I wanted to be like, you know, the good uh, leader, as I saw other people who were like leaders of networks and projects before, you were like getting somehow grumpy about uh, their folks doing their own thing. And I was uh, just felt like I needed to be correct in that sense. It took me two or three years to, two years actually, to start to, start to not to, well, not to start seeing, see things clearly, but to um, start to say what I see instead of trying to tell myself that something is wrong with the way I was seeing things. Yeah. I mean, that must have been 
sort of tragically ironic to see your your urgency and your ideas turning in the exact opposite direction from what you were trying to work on. <laughs> sure. I, uh, I notice in Emil's story that a lot of it is his personal emotional response. He is, feels creeped out by a certain person or a certain scenario. I'm wondering yeah. for you, Sebastian, what your feelings were like, how did you, how did you feel around Felix? How did you feel around Kai? What was your sense of them as people? Well, um, Felix at the beginning for the very first seven or eight years that we knew each other, we were like best friends. And that time he was very different than, than the way he is now. I can hardly explain to myself his psychological structure of today. I can hardly empathize with it as um, back then it was uh, really very gentle, docile even and soft and uh, we've got easy going and um, and I was more the leader and he was more like being filled up with things. There were some strange elements like he for many years did not get feedback on things but there was kind of a, like okay for me at that point. Um, we were just hanging out, uh, hanging out a lot and and later on, for the first two years of going change, they went all after me, trying to tell, trying to guilt trip me also on every occasion. I have more buttons for this than Emil seems to have, so it's good for him, bad for me. <laughs> and so they were trying to tell me all this shit, like I'm like so cold-hearted and such a bad person and hurting other people so much. And they were trying, trying to tell me how I like, hurt Felix and... Uh, Kai and everyone there so much that I needed to just look into myself, look into myself, look into myself. And I was kind of like confused with that because I mean, um, I had no one else to talk to about this. And at that time, today, I'm um, like 2016 to 2018. So um, I was confused whether to trust, my, trust how I feel them should be or see that all as a part of my crazy pathological projection because I'm so emotionless and arrogant and whatever. And uh, yeah, so that was difficult. Yeah, but generally the, the description email gave, gave about them being like, so uh, I don't remember the exact words, but being like having this dead eyes and being stone. Like, um, I mean, from a classical tragical perspective, um, they just like uh, became pathological amber red thing like you know some stalinists and uh, or some fundamentalist religious people who don't care about anything anymore within the other and um the 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 the, the atmosphere is also one of violence extreme violence covered by all this talk of love and light mor mor morality and integrity and we space things yeah, so for me, it's difficult in, in some way because there's some of these elements that I've co-created that I personally like, and there are all these pathological elements as well that are so and so scary. So to, to, to me, some of the elements of um, the radicalism and determination are sympathetic, but the content is uh, completely nuts. And that makes it, yeah, that makes it like ambival feeling, an ambivalent feeling of the situation. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that makes this such an interesting situation is there's a lot of things we like. There's a lot of things we can relate to. And yet the style in which it's manifesting is clearly not what we want to have. And that's really tough for people to work through those things. Like you were saying, Sebastian, you didn't have anyone to talk to to process this. Emil, you had your wife, which I'm sure is a real advantage in going oh, yeah. through those she, things. She, she saved my ass. <laughs> Um, she saved my ass. No, she was the first to notice that that something uh, something was off, and we had each other to you know reflect upon what was uh, what was going on. I don't know what would have happened if she she, she hadn't been around. Um, and it's also what they tried to do. Like what they wanted to do was, of course, to split us up. You know, it's like always, oh, yeah, bring your fiance. You know, we would really like to meet you. Like it was actually lucky that I was like worn out from, 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 from a very stressful vacation with children. <laughs> um, and then just, oh, I just needed to stay a few days in my room because there was also, they really needed to have contact with me in order to manipulate me and get me on board. Um, and luckily it, it didn't happen because I wasn't available and uh, yeah, my wife was there. So. 
By the way, what, what Emil is telling is also absolutely typical. So the first time Emil told, told me you know, the, the, the story, I couldn't stop laughing and I didn't do now because I, I already heard and I read it before. But at that uh, point, it's just so incredibly typical. You don't get a rest or a pause or anything like that. You're like really attacked uh, on all levels permanently. <laughs> It's, um, it may sound weird to people who, do, who don't know this, but that is the reality. Once you're like, for example, in a room with them and you disagree with something, you have like 10 people going straight at you. <laughs> There's no way you could like uh, isolate yourself, reflect, think about anything. That's mm -hmm. not anything you could do. <laughs> and, they, and they're good at it. It's like they are doing this on a daily basis. You know, you just come up there. You have no, diff like they are trained and they love it. You know, that was like the only point where, where I saw joy in their faces. That was, you know, when they really managed to, yeah, uh, outmaneuver us or, yeah, uh, make us lose our shit, basically. Um, There's certain elements of that that seem necessary. Like, obviously, we have to face our reactive things. We have to challenge our ego structures. We may or may not have to get some distance from the social networks and relationships that we have in our lives. So these are very valid things to a certain degree. And Sebastian, you were talking about setting up a structure where some of those more perhaps dangerous things might come in later in a group or a community once they are more mature. So the way they're doing it, like, is the problematic element the style? Is the problematic element the intention? Is the problematic element that it's coming too soon in the process? You know, how does this look different from a healthy, sane way of doing some of the same things? Yeah, I think that was one for you, Sebastian. Yeah, that was for you, Sebastian. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, two things come to my mind first. There was something interesting. Andrew once said on um, like next, either we have a breakthrough or a breakdown. And I think that's a sane and healthy uh, group would be one where, where things would work in the direction of helping you and support you in having a breakthrough and not a breakdown. And the point is that every kind of spiritual practice can be used to um, share your ego. But the other point is what comes right after that. Like, what is the intention that is behind that? And often enough in groups that are, that are doing some intensive work, especially if it involves we space work, which is um, something that... Um, gives even more control over your reality to, to an outside world. It's not just transcendence work where you like have meditative experiences, but you also have state experiences that are happening between us. And then you have like these practices that are orienting you towards something that is beyond, that is not yourself. So you have all these ego dissolving things. And um, if, the if the leadership is consciously or unconsciously pathological or also ruled by shadows and re regressive and pathological tendencies, these might just um, snap in and use you or use your state of being shattered once it happens um, into other directions. And I guess, or I guess most people also can guess that, that most um, guru figures or leadership figures have, are obviously humans and have like capacities and pathologies. And these pathologies can kick in at um, that point and the other thing is really the, 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 the velocity. Like I had these, I, this idea that some stuff like shadow work, emotional work and um, tantric work and things like that would come later, especially for uh, an integral group like I already planned it because I felt uh, that the people, if they were touched at their guilt level, shame level and all these things, they were coming too fast into a regressive mode identifying with their inner child, with their uh, pre-conventional selves and would lose their own maturity and uh, self-regulation and deliberation and so on. And I felt that it made no sense for a healthy and sane integral evolutionary container or metamodern container to like um to 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 force the people to identify with feeling guilty or feeling ashamed or anything like that in the very first place they should be feeling uh well with themselves and be, always be able to have a zone of autonomy 
And if the methodology involves getting you out of that zone extremely fast right away and never letting you in again, and always telling you things that you should believe without you ever having the possibility to check that out, if that's really what you see, feel, think, then um, it's just highly, highly problematic. And you have to, um, I mean, some people whom I respect did experiment with these things in the 90s and in the zero years, but I have come to the conclusion that that does not make any sense. I've been thinking a lot about super radical ideas. I mean, radicalism is like one of the main um, interests and topics in my life, what that means to be extremely consequential about something. And I've come to the conclusion that all these ideas of subs uh, suspending ego completely, permanently, and helping you, and you should just, you know, doubt without doubt, believe and give yourself other that, um, that that only makes sense as a temporary technique, like in prayer or something like that. But it does not make any sense for human beings of today to, to regress back to these um, myth, more mythological or amber mythocentric forms of spirituality. Yeah, and so, um, and that is, these are two things, immediate, like immediate breakdown of your structure and complete control and never letting get back again and then obviously uh, abusing you emotionally financially sexually making you work all day something a lot of people at Gone Change don't talk about if you are not in sex groups or you're not in talk groups or not in any kind of special group just for you you're like working 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 like squirm on the floor all day and the people there are a um, bunch of postmodernists none of them is very good at cleaning so they take like all day to do anything yeah, so <laughs> uh, that's yeah, yeah, that's my basic answer. Thank you, e Emil. You were initially invited to Zeg to discuss hierarchical complexity, <laughs> right? And there's uh, there's simpler and more sophisticated ways to have complexity hierarchy models. Uh, some are much better than others, but are they are they inherently dangerous? Like, is there there's a situation here in which complexity is being treated as a kind of status, which is problematic. Right. But is do you think there's something about complexity models that inherently lend themselves to misuse? Or is it just that anything can be misused? Yeah, well, like, that's what I would say. Like, is metal inherently dangerous? Well, like, is anything that is powerful and can actually do something, you know, um, it can both be productive and destructive. Yeah. And, and we, we see that, that, that stage theories are extremely useful, right? And that's also what makes them dangerous. Like a shit theory that doesn't do much is not very dangerous, but it can't do much good in the world either. However, what I see with the, the way they do and go and change is like they're not using stage theories. They're not using the model of hierarchical complexity. They're just using the fucking words that Michael Commons came up with, right? Um, and, and instead of like in normal, uh, usually in sex uh, on cults, they say, OK, I'm, I'm more enlightened. Yeah. And they have just uh, replaced being enlightened when we being more developed. Yeah. It basically means the same. And it's also when they talk about shadow, what they mean is sin. Yeah. So they are just like using the, the, the lingo from adult development theory. And, and, and that's it. Um, it's all it's like they do not understand the model of hierarchical complexity. Sebastian, you talked a few times about um, state change practices and the, the class of states that we normally call something like subtle that involves our, you know, energetic and imaginal perceptions of things. A lot of people who uh, are able to go into this, those states and also experience individuals and groups that seem to have this socially predatory nature often perceive it as something demonic, as, as, a, as a possession of some kind. Do you think that's a legitimate way to perceive this? Or, or should we just focus more strongly on social and psychological dynamics? Well, first of all, I think that if you have a pathological psychosocial dynamic and you have a state change into subtle stages, subtle, um, sorry, stages, states, 
um, you can perceive the, psych the pathologies of those psychosocial situations very differently. I mean, even if you're not a spiritual practitioner, if you're just, you know, doing like psychedelic substances and you're having a weird moment with your friends, that also feels really creepy. Or you would have that same weird moment with your friends uh, without being on shrooms or something, uh, you would feel very much normal. Uh, yeah, and the same thing happens um, there. I mean, is the question you asked is really about the word demonic? Did I get that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a difficult one. I had a, uh, I, I, I wrote a series on uh, four, not, not on sex, but four people who are insects uh, called the objectification of evil. And I use the term, especially after reading Religion of Tomorrow by uh, Ken Wilber, who uh, took this Aurobindian idea of something like a Luciferian um, splitting happening in the involution ev sequence from supermind to overmind, where there's some kind of evil force coming out of there. And I, and I thought that to be interesting because I realized that evil is also something that um, that is not just... I mean, for rational people, evil is, sounds like a silly idea, and it was like that for me too for for most part of my life. But then I started to realize that one could also speculate if evil is just simply something rationality can't get, and that it might also be involving something like uh, trans-rational things. I'm not really sure. So my main idea is that um, that 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 regression and pathology, normal forms of regression and pathologies combined with intensive state experiences. They just feel very different. I've seen some people over the course of um, my own uh, participation in this world who, who might I also worked with who seemed to be extremely evil at some point where I looked, uh, I saw something in them that was really shocking me. But um, analyzing it, it's mainly just childhood trauma or something like that combined with strong state experiences and state change practice. So I'm not yet, uh, I mean, I'm not a supermind or overmind. I can't say for myself using Ken Weber's ideas and that. Uh, so <laughs> maybe it's really demonic. I don't know, but that is as far as I've uh, come in this regard. Yeah. We're talking about evil. Like, what do you mean? Like sadism uh, or, or like if we are to define what is evil, evil can be like neglect, you know, or it yeah. can be to exploit people. But like the most evil of evil, that would be like sadism, that someone derives pleasure from someone else's pain or from inflicting someone pain. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, it could be. I mean, it, through, I was with you, through a certain Im imaginal lens or certain kind of state that people that have those drives might be perceived in this other way. Or mm. we might think, I mean, this connects to things like, you know, Freud's notion of a death drive and, you know, whether yeah. there's some part of ourself that actively wants to wreck the things that are valuable. Yeah, because I mean, like, if it's just to get power, that's like the banal form of, of, of evil that, uh, yeah, I'm abusing people just to get more power because that feels fucking great. But the thing, you know, where it's become really evil, evil, that's like the sadism part. And, and yeah, I also... I also heard from you and I read elsewhere that, you know, um, yeah, some sadomasochistic tendencies um, in uh, Go and Change are uh, prevalent. Is that something you know anything about, Sebastian? Oh, that was, that was, that, 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 yeah, that, that was, <laughs> that topic. He doesn't want to talk about that part. I to close the window, the windows, some heavy machinery outside. You mean like uh, sexual experiments there involving sadistic things, or did they get the question right? It was quite loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, yeah. I, Something I was, like I that. Was I have been hearing these stories about yeah, uh, sad or messages. I think there's, I think, I think there's a lot on that, but I'm not too informed about that. I know that there is some kind of shamanic, uh, shamanically derived uh, sexual practice going on there that involves um, exploring what people have as um, different forms of pleasure and pain and, fa and fetishes and, and different things, but I'm not too informed about that. I know it's like uh, it's divided into two, three or four or five sessions or something like that, and, and it goes for all kinds of themes and topics that uh, might come up in sexuality. Yeah. Because, I mean, I, I even hear that like, there's this w woman who actually got injured 
and they haven't even denied. They said, no, that's a private matter, like say, like injuries to her genitals. Like there must be some re really obscene things going on there, dangerous things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've seen some, I was only there once uh, when something like that um, happened, like not with an injury, but when a pair was split up. That was around the time where I started to really fight with myself with all of this uh, complete nonsense or if I'm complete nonsense. That was at the beginning of 2018. And I noticed that the people, I mean, one common theme there was always that if you had problems with something, it was obviously your shadow and freeing yourself from your shadow, but also free yourself from all these blocks, blocks that would, um, the energy would then flow through and it would be incredibly healthy for you. And even if you didn't feel it would be incredibly healthy, if the group would be asked, if, if they feel that it was incredibly healthy for you and everyone said yes to that, then uh, it was also obviously completely uh, healthy. And so in some, in some way, this whole thing of producing pain and catching you with that and uh, getting you on a hook with that when you're like struggling, when you're feeling pain, when you're feeling miserable, it was generally a common theme or is generally a common theme. Like it is many of these uh, containers because technically what is happening in, in, in a lot of these um, these groups, there is a fe fetish, the actual word, way you say it in English, fetish of pain and struggle and, and, um, and pressure. I have a feeling, it's, it's, since I'm, since I'm uh, looking at spiritual groups, and I also practiced this uh, as a leader of my uh, network previously to some extent, but only for, um, well, not really comparable to what they do, that there's somehow a fetish uh, of putting people under pressure and I think there's something pathological sexual happening at the moment, which you, for yourself, um, contextualize as spiritual, as uh, putting people under pressure so they somehow confront ego. And there's a real craze about this. I've been in other sanghas which practice this, go and change practice this, even I, as I said, practice this in some sort of ways. And um, it's, it's something like a pathology that runs through many spiritual um, groups, some, some form of sadism is generally gen generally there always in all kinds of practices does it make some sense yeah i think that's a really interesting topic this fetishization of putting pressure on people as a sort of uh, spiritual ego overcoming tool you know uh, in my conversations with andrew cohen because you mentioned enlightened next he's sort of been seemingly reflecting on the fact that he might have been leaning too much into that style over the years what do you think? Do you have an impression of the of the change in his mentality? Do you think he's um, how deeply do you think he's assimilated the fact that that technique you were just describing of trying to overpressure the ego may have been an error, or may have been an exaggeration, or problematic? Well, I can tell my um, my relation to Andrew Cohn and the like nice is complex. So generally, um, his work and the like next work is in the form of the teaching of evolutionary spirituality has contributed massively to my life. And I also had affirmative experiences that, uh, that give me a sense that, that there's really much about it. And then I was, but I, but I was at Enlightened Next and was very skeptical about what was happening there, though my experience was more uh, that it was too to boring and to confirmist and things like that. So I did, I was not involved in these things. In my experience, I had some communication with Andrew and that was very positive. Um, especially for example, um, I criticized Enlightened Next massively online and he and uh, working partners of him contacted, contacted me because of that, because they were so positive about my really strong constructive criticism while also affirming the positive contributions um, that had never happened to me before. Whenever I try to speak with people um, and try to combine lots of criticism and affirmation, uh, most people just hear one side. <laughs> and so that experience um, was really positive, but I also was not there uh, in the 90s and zero years of enlightenment. Next, I mean, I guess a lot of things happened there where I can, could probably totally relate that some people would never want to hear anything about it again <laughs> yeah so 
Uh, I have a difficult uh, standing in this regard. As with my extreme interest in radicalism, I'm, I'm always interested in topics that have this extreme ambivalence about contributions, pioneering contributions, and extreme pr problems. And um, yeah, so, uh, so I'm kind of like riding this wave, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of a loner in this regard and just giving us products of this. <laughs> Emil, in your article, you wrote that you consider cults to be the great totalitarian danger of the future. Uh, yeah. You had some advantages in this situation, uh, your wife and also your temperament that made you sort of robust against these things. Uh, I'm curious what you think in general are the vulnerabilities to cult-like phenomenon that people have and whether you think the vulnerabilities are increasing in the world. Well, I think it's increasing at the moment. You know, we had all these cult-like phenomena in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. And I re remember there was a lot of awareness back in the 90s. Um, but now it's been like 20 years, you know, and it's like, <laughs> it's just almost like the world is ready for another round. <laughs> And there's not so much awareness out there. And I feel that it's interesting enough, like in Germany, because you haven't had the idea like, Waco or like uh, you haven't had these like uh, really uh, uh, awful like cult phenomena where a lot of people have died. It hasn't happened in Germany. So I don't feel that there's so much awareness about the topic here. And also just like a concept like gaslighting. Uh, gaslighting, you could do it from a Hitchcock. It's a very very Anglo-Saxon concept. It doesn't translate well into Ger German. So people didn't know what gaslighting was. So I, I feel that at the moment, because that, that that's, we, we are very vulnerable because the need for, for uh, communion, for community and, 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 and spiritual development and, and, and also better mental health has never been greater. Yeah? And um, people are just longing for these things. I, 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 I remember that like 10 years ago, I wanted to create a metamodern uh, political party before I knew anything about the concept metamodern. And people thought we wrote a, a manifesto or people thought it was a great idea. Let's do it. Let's just not make a party, but let's make like a, yeah, um, not a cult, but like a community, right? And then these things can de de develop into becoming cults. And people really want this and um, we haven't been vaccinated. Like we, we need, everyone needs to get a jab against uh, calls. We need to be informed. That's also why I'm doing this. People need to learn about gaslighting. Uh, they need to learn about we spacing, uh, we spaces and how they can be exploited. And also that people need to trust themselves and not to not feel with them. Um, what would what, what they think themselves? Because the whole thing at, 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 at the gather, gathering or at this, um, at this summer camp, just hear more and more stuff. Oh, it doesn't matter if it doesn't feel right. And it's often in the way that things don't feel. You shouldn't listen to yourself, you know. And, you know, people on a higher level of development, they, they know it. Like, I, I just saw so many things that that people were asked not to listen to themselves because, oh, no, no, it's just your shadow. It's just your ego, you know, this evil stuff. Trust me instead because I'm the enlightened, highly developed one, you know. And, yeah, I, we need to inform the public not to fall for this kind of bullshit, you know. Listen to yourself. If it feels bad, leave, yeah. Do you, do you think these people are creepy? Leave, yeah. Trust yourself. That's really interesting because there's a kind of ambiguity there, right? On the one hand, I think what you're saying is absolutely true that people, they don't feel secure in trusting themselves and they tend to give too much authority over to social dynamics that are happening and that leads them to be manipulated. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there seem to be things about ourselves that might also lead us to be manipulated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Sebastian, what do you think? Because it's very easy to say, yeah, cults are bad. We don't want to get trapped in cults. I want that inoculation. Vaccinate me against cults. But there may be things about my feelings and the way I behave and the way I judge people that I think are perfectly reasonable, but which will lead me into these situations over and over again. Yes. So you know, what is it that, that we don't know we're wrong about that leads us into these situations? So I've obviously thought about the question a lot and I have a direct answer to this. 
Um, when you're in a sane and healthy evolutionary path, you're usually struggling between selves of yourself, between a higher aspiration that comes from your own experience and your own thoughts, and possible regressions and pathologies, shadows that you yourself can see. And usually people who lead spiritual communities have gone through this process by themselves. And then they want others to go through this process, but with their voice as the higher voice and with the others just following. And that is the crucial mistake. People have to be autonomous about their own spiritual and conscious evolution and journey. It, uh, and a lot of these things formed as a reaction to postmodern narcissism. Like not not necessarily and there was some there were things like that prior to that, but the new wave of pseudo integral spirituality that that re fetishizes this 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 whole pressure thing. You don't know what you feel. You don't know what you should really think. You are not in a good. You you are not good, and we know better than you do. I mean, in some way, that's just a regression to the Middle Ages, to the church who sees your original sin and they can tell you what's right and you can't see it and you can never see it, so you always have to listen. And the other side is really that people have gone into this whole reclaiming their inner child, their own uh, needs and desires, postmodern spiritual things so much that a lot of people in the 80s and 90s felt that the path to awakening and enlightenment and real growth was stunted because, of, um, or can we well call this boomer writers? And there were all these forms of criticisms. But the point is, you would have to, in my opinion, discover your own narcissism, your own regressions, your own tendencies by yourself. If someone else do, does it, you come from one form of infantilism, narcissism, let's say, to another form of infantilism, which is like absolutism, ethnocentrism. Um, in any way, you're somehow childlike, somehow not, uh, not an adult, somehow not, not autonomous. So you just change one form of the pathology for the other. And, um, and for those people who want to stay within their narcissistic or hypergoic tendencies, I don't even know if I should even use the language, but let's, uh, let's just use it for a moment. If you have some savior complex and you think you should suppress them in order to help them awaken, then in my opinion, you're on a very, very problematic path. It makes no sense whatsoever. You, you must have the aspiration to evolve and awaken in yourself. If that isn't the aspiration, just don't go for it. And if you want to, if you want to align yourself with some call to, to try to tell you that you should aspire in these ways, but you don't feel it yourself, your real reason to join that call is probably something completely different. Just wanting to be in a group, just wanting to give you up yourself, just wanting to have security, something else. Yeah, so that's, um, and there, there's some part uh, of the spiritual journey that cannot be held from the outside. And that is a very important part, maybe even the most important part. And that's a big problem for we practice as well. <laughs> This is a lot of skills to ask of someone, right? Mm -hmm. Like you want to have an authentic sense of who you mm -hmm. are and how to use that and psychological self-awareness and critique and social awareness and high aspiration. Is it reasonable to expect people to be able to do that? Or will most people need to be on a spiritual journey that doesn't expect them to have all those capacities? Well, I still have a radical point of view in this regard. I mean, I've been thinking about this for 10 or 12 years. And I think it's absolutely reasonable to have a maximum set of criteria. And uh, religion usually had many functions. One of them was also to create social coherence and to give hope to the broken. And I think 90% of the people who have like spiritual practices, I think mean, this, this number is just made up, but you know, 90% uh, of the people who are engaged in spirituality today belong to these groups to have some kind of social coherence, to, to feel not broken, to feel like they are someone, even if life um, puts them down, or you have this this old critique from Chichek where like social problems are people trying to spiritualize them away, not really knowing why they are in all these situations. Yeah, and uh, uh, and 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 factually, um, I mean, if you just look at it from a developmental psychological perspective, the only people who are really able to disidentify from thought, things like that, are people in teal and turquoise. And that is less than 1% of the population, probably. 
So that is more uh, rational estimation of who should actually enter the spiritual realm. You can think that is a freaky thing to say. <laughs> I'm aware of that, but um, but uh, I've looked at everything, and and the best I've seen are people who who end up in boring places, and the worst uh, extreme destruction and pathological places. So um, I'm not convinced of this whole idea of bringing people upwards. I tried that myself, but um, yeah. So this this is just the result of my reflection of what I experienced. Thank you, Emil. There's um. You know, modern society it very easily looks at what we might call pre-modern society and says, well, there's a lot of cult-like tendencies there. <laughs> there's a lot of suppression of the individual. There's a lot of dogma and submission to symbolism. But uh, metamodernism, part of what it does is have a critique of modernity. Uh, to what degree do you think mainstream modern society is itself cult-like? Well, I would actually turn it, turn it around that it's not cult-like enough. Ah. The problem with <laughs> modern society is that it doesn't satisfy our, um, our emotional needs for community and for, you know, meaning, right? Like modern society is pretty meaningless, you know, like um, we have made a way with, with God, you know, and, and, and all these enchanted stories. And basically you're just like a producer and a consumer on a market, you know, and a democratic citizen who can, who can leave your a vote at the ballot. You know, it's not very sexy. You know, it's not very meaningful. You know, it quickly becomes very empty, you know, and you are considered an individual, you know, and we live in a very individualized uh, culture. Uh, so, of course, people are just so thirsty for community and, and for, for ex existential truth that, um, that they are drawn to these kind of things, you know, and, and, and their unmet needs, you know, are exploited. That's why we need metamodern politics. Like we need Gemeinschafts politics. We, meet, we need existential politics, right? We need to make sure that every citizen have good relationships, that um, that uh, as few as, as possible feel lonely. Yeah? And um, we also need that everyone develops their relationship to themselves. Like right? not only do we need to develop our relationship to other people uh, and, 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 and create some idea of a greater community that we are part of, we also need to develop a relationship to ourselves. And that's where metamodern politics come in. And I think that in a metamodern uh, society, people's needs will be fulfilled to an extent that cults will remain a very marginal phenomenon. But as it is now, cults are on the rise. Um, sadly. Sebastian, you were talking about um, the enlightened next people reaching out to you because they were sort of interested in this combination of... Uh, praise and criticism and that's a comparatively rare thing right most many groups many corporations many individuals certainly many uh, spiritual teachers and spiritual organizations don't like to receive any critique at all they treat that as hostile they think it undermines the great task that they're undertaking how much of a problem in all of this do you think is the the unwillingness or the lack of curiosity about negative feedback and the inability to process uncomfortable feedback from others. Mm -hmm. First of two other things. Uh, first of all, I think the point Emil just made about a really well-integrated society, a medium modern society, um, raising the need to join a cult is just wonderful because cults are really um, in some way splitting off from society because there's some need you cannot get mad. And it needs also like with the ideas of metamodernism about existential politics and also the pol politics of theory, which, which somehow fulfills the need to be a conscious civilization and things like that. If these needs are actually met, um, then the people will not feel uh, the need to split up and uh, join some container like that unless they're getting out of society because of some regressive reasons. But at least the higher aspirations leading people to pathologically split themselves off would really get uh, integrated with uh, what, for example, uh, comes up in the second book about Peter Mars. So that's a very, very good point. Um, yeah. Also, it was Enlightened Next doesn't exist anymore since 2013. Like Andrew and his co working people, they reached out to me just in the last two years or two years ago. 
Okay, um, so your question is very important, I think. Um, my, my point of view is that one should use the quadrivia of Ken Wilber, which is like the inside and the outside of all four quadrants, because I use this model. So there are other models you can use as well, but this is the simplest um, approach. Um, uh, forgive me even for not using also meta modern language parallel, but I'm still like working myself into my meta modernism. It's just added uh, the second book, and I'm still integrating so many things out of there. <laughs> I still, uh, integral is uh, just really simple to me to use. So, anyway, um, if you were like, for example, in the in group, like the inside of us, we uh, have values, we have certain feelings we share, we have ways we feel into the world and feel into ourselves and all these things. And then we might also take a look from the outside, which might be zone three and zone four in the Kujibia model. And uh, I think that people who criticize sex, often they don't understand what's up within the sex. So there's something I often find problematic in um, a lot of articles um, who tr which try to criticize sectarian tendencies from a conventional middle centrist social perspective because they don't know why or what, what the treasure is within the group. What is the in-group reality? And in-group people, they feel like we have this treasure. And the out-group people, they don't understand us. So what's really necessary in us to think as long as we did not realize this super global meta modern project and or as long as we're on the way there uh, uh, to, to the point um, is uh, that that real avant-garde groups must combine both perspectives they can't expect the other ones to take both perspectives but they themselves must combine uh, both perspectives on three zone uh, four and zone seven uh, and zone eight which is the inside outside of the system yeah, so that's just actually my answer to this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm curious from you, Emil, a similar kind of thing. Like, uh, these are obviously people who, in their behavior, want to attack others for their shadow material. Like, they're saying to everybody else, you guys are not uh, experiencing these problems in yourself. But when people go to them with feedback and say, hey, here's what we think is problematic, they don't want to hear anything about that. <laughs> No, they, they have the system, you know, yeah. in the hierarchy yeah. that the, the people at the, at the highest levels, at the highest mm -hmm. stages, um, they can mirror uh, uh, um, the, the people on the lower levels, but the people on the lower levels cannot uh, mirror the ones on the higher levels, which makes that Felix, you know, you, you are not allowed to, to mirror him or criticize him or anything. And if he does, he would just argue that uh, no, he's on the cross parodic magic, which is which is the highest. And pretty sure that he hasn't uh, discovered that um, Michael Commons has actually created a, a, a new, even higher stage, namely, um, <laughs> and what was it? it? Was like meta cross parodic magic. And I'm sure that had he had he been aware of that, then he would have claimed to have been meta, meta cross parodic magic. But that's like you know that's like, again like a really twisted use of stage theory. Um, and, and really, here the mirroring is is is, is just it's just a it's just an instrument of control. Yeah, you know, if I'm able to say a lot of deep and nasty truth about you all the time, and you cannot say that to me, you know, and you are also of a higher authority in relation to truth, you know, come on. <laughs> um, yeah, I I know you described them earlier, Felix, as um, as not really. <laughs> coming not really understanding these higher levels no no but, okay, like, like everyone else he smashed yeah. she smashes together like uh, the model of hierarchical complexity you know that's only one of four dimensions of development you know so when he start also in the same senses of saying oh yeah being on a higher level like um, meta systematic or paradigmatic and then also mixes in your ability to show greater love and these kind of things that is something the model doesn't uh, yeah. doesn't uh, measure at all which is like a clear indication that he doesn't uh, doesn't understand the model you know he's just like using as if anyone else you know who have like these yeah these stages where you smash both depth and complexity uh, into the same model 
Um, you know, you could excuse the guy, like, because guys, they tend to read about the model of hierarchical complexity and then people, oh, I'm on the highest stage because I understand what's in the text. You can forgive a, a, a person for, for doing that. However, his, his, his use of just using just the names and, uh, yeah, and then using it as, as an instrument of power, that is, that is yeah, unforgiven, unforgivable. Yeah, I'm, there's a thing there I'm curious about, and um, either of you, I'd love to hear your ideas on this, because in the one sense, you can say, well, I read about something, therefore, I know how to talk about that thing. That, But really, I'm not there. I just read about it. It's content. It's not really a description of how I function. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, you could say in the Ken Wilber sense, where there's multiple developmental lines or trajectories, that maybe a person can actually be at a higher stage in one part of themselves, but emotionally, morally, interpersonally, they're nowhere near their best line. Yeah, exactly. That, that's the whole point of, uh, of Hans's book, The Listing Society, <laughs> that we have four, four dimensions. And, uh, you know, it's really from, uh, come from this observation um, when, when we discovered, you know, spiral dynamics and Ken Wilber back in the days that, hey, it's a bit that just that that person is postmodern or, or green and that person is metamodern, integral, yellow or whatever. It's just, wait a second, it's not that easy because sometimes you have people on a very high level of complexity and they don't have but but when it comes to depth like spiritual depth no they're just like pretty mainstream and then they have very high complexity but subscribe to normal mainstream uh uh, mainstream values and also the same thing that we have people who are spiritually very very well developed but when it comes to complexity eh, not so much and then they just have this like yeah you know normal postmodern spirituality uh, full of game denial uh, and, and it really is that we have these four dimensions we have depth on the one side you know complexity on the other but then it also uh, matters um, what kind of code you have currently installed like if you've been living if like a very complex uh, and deep thinker in the middle ages would not have access to any modern code would still be medieval despite being very well developed and so it also matters uh, with the code. And then it's also what kind of states you are in. And have you, um, have you encountered heaven and hell? Um, this is also something that matters. Sebastian, in Emil's story, he encounters these people that he describes as being kind of uh, dead-eyed, you know, vitally shut off in various ways. From his point of view, there'd be no way to tell whether this movement is attracting people like that or whether it's taking people and causing them to become like that. But from your point of view, you sort of saw the movement develop and emerge. Is it causing those effects or is it attracting people that are already predisposed to be like that? Um, Both in some way. I mean, people who are attracted are not really like that when they are attracted. So people are usually attracted right um, with these, with, with, for example, I'm a story about this guilt tripping thing. Uh, people who are easily, who are, who are very much high on openness and who you can attack on their features easily. And, um, but you can't, psych- you, you can also say that psychologically people who are very vulnerable, very open, what they actually also want to be is very solid, very stable. And uh, probably this end result of them becoming really robotic, becoming really extremely determined, becoming just really absolutist, is also like the um, the shadow or the, the polar opposition of this. Um, it's, it's like the need of people who are very fragile and very vulnerable to be the absolute opposite of that. And so the two are intertwined, I think. It's not the kind of people who are attracted, but it's something that people who are attracted are attracted to. Right. So, I mean, there's a, they're setting up a situation where they're trying to use fairly advanced models of complexity development to justify a very old fashioned kind of hierarchical social arrangement. Uh, but there's an interesting question here is like, what is the appropriate relationship between people of different complexity levels or different developmental specializations when you're setting up a community or an organization, right? If we're not going to say that people who are superficially more complex get a magical status and no one can question them, uh, 
then how, how are we going to organize communities where we take complexity seriously, but don't go down these dark pathways? Uh, e either of you. <laughs> well, well, obviously, um, in a community where some people are on a higher level of complexity of depth, you know, a natural hierarchy would emerge where the people who are, are more complex thinkers will become leaders because they are able at, uh, you know, solving very advanced problems, right? Um, but but it, it, it's really like in any other structures, yes, uh, we shouldn't create these social hierarchies by reference to like stage models, um, but they should help us understand why the hierarchies, you know, emerge in the first place, right? And, and, and really, it's also if you are a very well developed, uh, high, high, highly developed person, you are able to communicate like to people on lower levels of complexity why they are wrong or why you are right, and not by by using reference to. Uh, it's, it's like really a thing that w with these stage models, it's um, it's um, it's a show it don't don't tell it thing, right? right. Like, but the moment you say, oh, but I'm on a higher stage, you have already lost the game. Yeah, you have always shown that you are low stage. Yeah, if you have the need right. to use stage model models to 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 justify justify yourself, your actions or your position, then you're low stage, man. It reminds me of a there's like a joke in the United States about anybody who would want to be president should not be president. <laughs> but Sebastian, you've you've experimented with organizing people around. Um, you know, developmental stages, you've experimented with trying to accelerate people's growth. When you're looking back at all of that now, how, what do you think is the appropriate relationship of people who are seemingly at different levels of maturation um, within a community? Is it like Emil says, like it can be there, but it would spontaneously emerge just by capacity and interaction? Yeah, for me, it's not like that. Um... For me, uh, I, I think this historically this emergence of the differentiation between growth hierarchy and suppression hierarchy and having a, uh, a scientific look and development in these things is so new. That the question is very much out there and we are experimentally answering it. And I think we, um, the Tilari Shadan once said, everything that can done must be done. And there is... Uh, that is my, my answer to that. So I'm I'm setting up my new group uh, or the continuation of my group now with a completely new experiment, which is to invite only people, like I invite, uh, I invite people with um, invitations that contain criteria with which I hope to only invite well-integrated, well-developed people. At this moment, my thesis, so this is really, these are real experiments. I'm not, I'm not saying that makes any kind of sense. God gave it to me or anything like that. It might turn out and get to a completely new nightmare and I might form or help the formation of another six act or something like that. I don't really know, but um, but it seems to be more healthy to me. Um, to uh, my, my, my thought right now is that most groups, like if you have post Mars, um, you usually have uh, in the postmodern groups mostly uh, postmodernists, uh, which is not really true. I mean, if you think about like the criticism of the rights, other things, you often have people who are postmodernists and people who are pre conventional going together. But in most um, normal groups, you usually don't have this mixing up of so many stages. Only in the group society, you have this mixing up stages, which makes society so complex and subculture so simple. And um, the idea of forming uh, subcultures consisting of several stages is itself something one could like look at. Maybe it's also something that comes from people who want to sell esoteric and spiritual practices to as many people as possible. Uh, integralism always was uh, co-evolving with this whole spiritual scene where people want to sell spiritual stuff to many, many people. So selling things to many people and really integrating them all also co-developed co in, in some way. Yeah, but uh, generally I think that, um, I mean, this this one thing which also metamorphism contains this as well, evolutionary enlightenment contains this, integralism is that evolution is becoming conscious of itself and starting to become conscious evolution. 
And so this is the one thing that leads people to think that we actually want to take the new discoveries of an evolutionary perspective in the world to um, enhance evolution. And so the very first idea they come to is to, um, to, to, to make some sort of strategy based on these evolutionary or developmental models, right? And um, so necessarily we, or a lot of us at least, tend to want to do something with it. But I think we're in an experimental, experimental situation. And um, I'm still thinking also about this whole natural emergence thing uh, Emma, Emma talked about in the article as well. I'm gonna continue with experiments. And generally we, we all should continue gathering data. So that's actually my, my answer. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Emil, uh, you said in your article, this is some serious CIA shit in, in regards to the drug use and the programming and the sexuality mm -hmm. and stuff. And we, we know looking back now that we have more historical data that some famous, you know, problematic transformational communities like the Manson family turned out to have been very infiltrated and overseen by government projects that wanted to know what they could do <laughs> you know can we ex can we extort people by getting their confessions can we reprogram their brains can we turn people into killers can we set up new communities so we're still getting more interesting data about what really went on there you know do you think it's possible that uh go and change has some kind of connection like that or do you think in a more general sense that transformational and developmental communities should be aware of the fact that they might be of interest to intelligence organizations and other forces. Well, I, I'm I'm not a fan of co co conspiracy theories. You know, I would need to have any indications or evidence uh, sure. suggesting something that even to consider the thought. Yeah. So I, I have no idea. I have no idea. And what 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 I have an idea about. What I think is scary is that all of this stuff is available online yeah like for example kai you know like, like sebastian told me he was bedridden for five years just studying all of these mind control uh, 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 methods right it, it's right out there if you want to have access to uh, and, and learn about these things you can just do it yeah? you don't need to go to yeah uh, called university sure. um, and that's like really scary yeah yeah, that is very interesting because we talked about whether or not the the vulnerabilities that are in us that make us uh, easily manipulable by these things, whether that's increasing. But what's definitely increasing is the the knowledge and the technology by which anyone could take mm -hmm. advantage of oh, these now very well known tactics. It, it's an arm race, you know, like because at, at the same time, the public needs to to, to know about these things. Um, because the techniques out there are getting more and more sophisticated, right? Um, or like some people will have access to more sophisticated uh, techniques out there. Uh, another thing about, uh, I wanted to ask you, Emil, is um, what was uh, Daniel's take on this when you told him about it? Oh, it, it was interesting. I, I, I called him and said, hey, I think there's like something fishy go, go, going on here. Uh, I didn't say much. I just uh, I said that, yeah, they have this this this, this thing called the Wii space. And they was like, okay, hold on, you know, <laughs> let, 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 let me try and explain. So he explained like all the stages of what's going on. Okay, there's a circle. And then there are some people in, like in each corner. And then whenever one guy says, then the next one, and they go bullying, and then they reveal all these uh, intimate truths, but the person can't say anything. Like he, he just knew all the stages. Uh, and, and can describe in detail what what this uh, we space was. Yeah. So so it's always like the we space is it's not a new invasion, it's not something that go and change has invented. They also used it in Enlightened Next, and and it is actually like in all cults. Like it's like standard cult feature that you have this because it's such an efficient tool to uh, control people. Like imagine sitting there like with twenty people. And then you feel like the whole room is against you. It's just like three people who sit like strategic, who like coordinate between you, but you feel the whole room is against you. And, and then you are lured in to reveal some of the most intimate truths. 
and then it's going to be used against you. <laughs> right? It's like very like, like why would I say in front of a lot of uh, of strangers like reveal some very intimate truths? And uh, I noticed that Felix he, he was just you know he wanted to get close to me just to gather information, and he was frustrated that it was not working. He was sitting talking to my or my wife was talking to him, and then I was like having an argument with one of the other guys, and he was like, oh, th- th- sh- "Shut up, shut up, please," you know, because he wanted to hear what I was saying. He just wanted to gather as much information about me as possible, you know, so he could use it against me. Imagine I would sit there in, in this Wii space and, and tell like some of my most intimate details. Yeah. And then like scary, scary stuff. So like, and, and the whole thing with, 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 the, with this Wii space, like, what, what, what I find very worrying is that it's kind of like a tro- tro- Trojan horse, right? They didn't go like full on, uh, 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 adult bullying, you know, and but just by being there with the Wii space and showing some of its like more promising uh, 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 aspects, you know, they're kind of legitimizing, normalizing the use of the Wii space and of the go and change people uh, leading them, you know, and then as it has become normalized, yeah, uh, and it's legitimate that these people, then they then they're suddenly in the eco village in the community and then they can flip it you know it's like a trojan horse and it's it's really super scary so in the beginning like people oh i cannot recognize what you're talking about emil they're so nice you know we were just like sitting there talking about emotions and whatnot yeah but all those things that you have said that they remember that they're going to use it against you later on and suddenly you know the whole thing is going to flip you know and um you know, bullying, you know, being bullied by a whole room, like you need to have a very strong psyche to uh, resist that. Uh, And most people don't. Sebastian, what is it then that distinguishes between uh, a we space practice that might help people get to a higher intersubjectivity and a we space practice that's going to pull them down to a lower intersubjectivity? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, as I said in my answer to your previous question, I am like going from one experimental phase to the next, so I'm just going to give you my current answer. Sure. Um, my current answer would simply be that if we uh, look at a we space um, from an, an equal perspective, we can simply say that what we space practice ideally is, is the formation of or like a intersubjective state experience. So lower left quadrant experience, a state experience on a higher stage of development or in a stage of development where the, you have only individuals at this point in time, but not yet anything like a culture. And so you would have to yourself be somehow within these states and on that on, and on the stage is targeted you individually have to have some competence yourself. So you also have your own motivation to come together with people in these intensities, in these states, in, on these stages. Mm. I personally believe that if you, if, if someone stages and states above you tries to motivate you, if that person is half a stage away or half a state away from you, you may be also be really motivated by something that's right one step ahead of you or something you have already entered in some way. But if there's too much of a distance, it cannot be an authentic motivation that you are actually motivated by what motivates that person. It's not possible. And I mean, you, you can maybe also be typologically alive so that other per- typologically alike, you know, um, so the other person might feel it would be good for you, something like that. But didn't turn, I didn't see that turning out well in practice. So the general point would be that you have your own interest to participate in that we space because you want to share your own stage in your own state and discover what the we space aspects of your stage and your state are. Yeah. So once again, idea. it's about autonomy. Sorry. No, I, I that idea of sharing seems like such an important component, both in terms of establishing a we space that's uh, reliable, 
uh, but also in terms of what Emil's doing here is bringing forth a story, which is also a story that's seen and interpreted from where he's at. And I was sort of uh, curious from you, Emil, what's your what's your best case scenario? What do you hope uh, this article does in terms of you sharing your experience with our overlapping communities here? Well, I, I hope that it will bring clarity to the people who are already involved involved with the with go and change. I hope that they're going to be kicked out of uh, of the SEC um, in Bad Belzig, and then I hope that it will serve as a warning for everyone in the meta modern and integral uh, community in Germany, because uh, I know that. Yeah, um, there's a lot of hype about Go and Change, you know, in integral circles uh, here in Germany. And I hope that the platform I have will be sufficient to warn everybody about Go and Change so that people will know, just like with Scientology, that these are people you should stay away from. I don't, of course, I don't expect that for the people who are in the cult itself, that there's anything that I can do. And, and normally, you know, with these cults that, the more they are under attack, the more members they lose, um, the more difficult it becomes to recruit new members, you know, the harder they become on the remaining members. Mm -hmm. So I am aware that that might be a consequence of my actions. But um, yeah, um, I feel that under all circumstances, the, the word needs to come out. Someone needs to talk about this and this, since I have a, a channel and uh, I have publicity, it's my duty to use it. Yeah, well, th thank you. Thank you for doing this. And uh, I'm essentially out of questions. Uh, so this is for both of you. Is there anything I should have asked you that I haven't asked you or anything you still want to say before we finish up? I think we're good. I think we're okay. good. You did a How good job. <laughs> How about you, Sebastian? Well, um, I just want to repeat and say in a concentrating way that I think that uh, what was called WeSpace practice has value and uh, we just did not really manage to differentiate well between pathological, regressive, distorted and actually progressive and integrated ways of that. Starting to prepare for this talk yesterday a little in my mind, I spontaneously started to write an essay about that and wanted to write the first really deep, deep timing thing to differentiate that so yeah that's one basic uh, message I want to give so people don't get uh, too negative about these things there's uh, something real to be discovered we just didn't um, approach it as complex as it needs to be approached until this point okay well, terrific. Thanks very much, guys. I think this could be extremely useful to some people. Thank yeah, you. thank you.